from wherever you've been. Come, broken hearted, let rescue begin. Come, find your mercy, oh sinner, come near. Earth has no sorrow that heaven can't heal. So lay down your Imagine a world free from all sorrow, sin, death, and destruction. A flawless world where all people of all nations live in perfect unity and freedom. Just imagine it. No sickness, loneliness, hunger, or war. One day, imagination will become the reality God has planned as revealed in the book of Revelation. This unforgettable book connects to the entire Bible and concludes the incredible story of God restoring his broken creation. Bible Study Fellowship is excited to invite you to explore the eternal hope in God's word in community, verse by verse, as revealed in Revelation, the hope. So we're about to hit a few rough weeks with Jesus in our lesson of John, right? But how thankful are we that there is hope? So this week, or well, I saw it this week, they released a little treasure to the teaching leaders. And it's the first two lessons of Revelation. And let me tell you, it is hope 
fulfilled. It is joyous because the sacrificial lamb is going to come back as the lion of Judah. Would you bow with me? Father God, I just asked, Holy Spirit, would you just settle over the hearts in this room? Would you settle over the hearts of the ladies in the coffee bar? Would you settle over the hearts of those satellites in Nebraska, Washington, Kansas, and Mauritius? Would you prepare our hearts to learn something new about you, to feel something great about you, to know you better through the words that you've given Melody? Lord, I just ask that you would bless her and give her joy as she delivers them. In Jesus' name, amen. Interesting that there's no light on because of the way that I'm going to be starting my lecture. So, in the beginning, God created light and He saw that it was good. He created the sky and the land, trees and oceans. He created every single animal and He saw that everything was good. On the sixth day, God created man, Adam. And from man, he created woman, Eve, and he saw that it was very good. Adam and Eve communed with God in the Garden of Eden. They walked with him and enjoyed a relationship with him. God told Adam, you can eat from any tree in the Garden of Eden except for the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. God gave man free will. Satan then enters the garden. He whispers lies to Eve, tempting her to doubt God's goodness and faithfulness. Satan's lies lead Eve to feeling discontent with all that she has and desiring the one thing she was told no to. Eve takes the forbidden fruit and she eats it. Then she gives it to Adam and he eats and thus sin enters the world. Because of their sin, Adam and Eve are kicked out of the Garden of Eden and cursed. Satan is cursed as well, being told, I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Adam and Eve leave the garden and enter a world of sin, not part of God's original plan. Fast forward with me thousands of years where we find another man entering a garden, This time, the man is Jesus, and the garden is the garden of Gethsemane. Again, Satan enters the garden, but this time through Judas. As Satan watches Jesus being bound and led away, as he watches him being beaten and tortured, being nailed to the cross to die a criminal's death, Satan thinks he's won again. And then he hears these words, it is finished. And Jesus lays down his life. Satan knows he has been defeated. God had a plan also. And God's plan would not fail. God's plan was to redeem that which sin and Satan destroyed. In order to do that, his son Jesus willingly gave his life as the perfect sacrifice. He died on our behalf. He died so that we don't have to. He died so that we can have a relationship with God now and for all eternity. When we truly believe in Jesus, our sins are washed away by his blood and we are made white, pure, clean. Jesus, our perfect substitute willingly suffered and died to pay the price for all sins. The first Adam fought a battle in the garden with the devil and lost. The last Adam, Jesus, fought a battle with the devil and came out gloriously triumphant. Because of his death and resurrection, sin, death, and the devil were defeated, resulting in the restoring of our relationship with God. As we examine John 18 today, we're going to split it into two divisions. Our first division, titled Jesus' Faithful Obedience, will cover verses 1 through 11. And our second division, titled Jesus' Humility and Suffering, will be verses 12 through 27. Let's look at our first division. John 18, 1 through 11, Jesus' Faithful Obedience. 
Verse 1 says, When he had finished praying, Jesus left with his disciples and crossed the Kidron Valley. The next few hours are going to bring about Jesus' arrest, trials, and crucifixion. Do you notice what he did right before stepping into his hour? He prayed. In chapter 17, John records the words Jesus prayed before entering the Garden of Gethsemane. And if we look at the other Gospels, we discover Jesus also prayed in the Garden as he waited for Judas and the soldiers to arrest him. Jesus is no stranger to the importance and power of prayer. Jesus, who is fully God and all-powerful, spent countless hours praying during his time on earth. He knew the best way to prepare for the coming battle was on his knees in prayer. The next few hours would require strength, discipline, composure, resilience. Jesus needed this time with his father in order to prepare for what was to come. When life feels overwhelming, when you know a battle is coming, follow the example Jesus set by going to God in prayer. John tells us Jesus and his disciples crossed the Kidron Valley on their way to the garden. The Kidron Valley is on the eastern slope of Jerusalem. A seasonal brook runs through the valley. The brook only flowed with water during the rainy season, which occurred in winter, so during this time of year, it would have little to no water in it. However, throughout Thursday and Friday of this week, lambs were being sacrificed in the temple ground because it's Passover. John MacArthur writes in Experiencing the Passion, historical records of Jesus' time indicate that as many as a quarter million lambs were slain in a typical Passover. So where did the blood from the 250,000 slain lambs and the water from the ritual cleansings go? According to MacArthur, the water and blood would have flowed down the altar, into the channels, out the temple, and into this brook. As Jesus sees the brook, red with the blood of the sacrificial lambs, he is reminded that as the Lamb of God, he too will soon be sacrificed. His blood, however, would cover over all sins of the world, and his sacrifice would fully and permanently defeat sin, death, and the devil. Jesus willingly steps over this brook and into God's predetermined plan. He will drink the cup the Father has given him. He will obediently lay down his life for his sheep and redeem that which Satan and sin destroyed. Verse 1 ends with, On the other side there was a garden, and he and his disciples went into it. The other gospel writers identify the garden as the Garden of Gethsemane. The Garden of Gethsemane was located within the, is it on? There, within the Mount of Olives, a place named for its ever-present olive groves. By looking through the gospels, we find out the garden's significance. It was a familiar place of comfort to which Jesus often retired. At this point in his life, Jesus had no permanent residence, no place he called home, but the garden was his place of rest and solitude. The Garden of Gethsemane was a place Jesus went regularly, a place where he taught his disciples. Because of the time spent in the garden, Judas knew the place well. John tells us this in verse 2 where he says, Now Judas, who betrayed him, knew the place because Jesus had often met there with his disciples. We observe through this verse, Jesus orchestrating the events leading to his death. He wasn't trying to hide from Judas. He was helping Judas lead the soldiers right to him. Verse 3 reads, Judas came to the garden guiding a detachment of soldiers and some officials from the chief priests and the Pharisees. They were carrying torches, lanterns, and weapons. A detachment of Roman soldiers could mean up to 600 men. In addition to that, there were also Jewish officials. Think of them like temple police. They would be the primary officials responsible for arresting Jesus and taking him to Annas. So we have a large number of men coming with torches, lanterns, and weapons to arrest Jesus. During Passover, the moon is full. 
If you've ever been outside during a full moon, you know how well lit nighttime can be. The men wouldn't have needed all the lanterns and torches, but they're expecting Jesus to run. Because the garden is full of trees, they're anticipating needing all the extra light they can get to search out and find Jesus when he runs. They also come with weapons. Many of the temple police would have recently witnessed Jesus cleansing the temple. Matthew 21, 12 says, Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. These men are expecting a fight and a search as indicated by their weapons, lanterns, and torches. But Jesus' plan is not to fight. He will faithfully obey his father's will and surrender his life. Jesus, knowing all that was going to happen to him, went out and asked them, who is it you want? Jesus knows what will happen from this point on, yet he courageously goes forth and meets the impending dangers. He was never a victim. He's a man with a plan, and he has sovereign control over all the details. By asking the arresting officers, who is it you want? Jesus is protecting his disciples. If the men are there to arrest Jesus, they have no reason to lay a hand on any of his disciples. Again, Jesus is controlling the outcome. After asking, who is it you want? Jesus receives the answer, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answers with, I am he, ego eimi in Greek. These are the exact words God used to identify himself to Moses in Exodus 3.14. When Jesus said, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. These mighty men sent to arrest Jesus stagger and stumble backward and fall flat by the power and force of Jesus' words. Isaiah 11.4 says, he will strike the earth with the rod of his mouth, with the breath of of his lips, he will slay the wicked. Second Thessalonians 2, 8 says, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord Jesus will overthrow with the breath of his mouth and destroy by the splendor of his coming. Jesus spoke words and the world came into existence. Storms were calmed by the power of God's words, of Jesus's words. People were miraculously healed simply with Jesus' words. Jesus has unlimited power, and he has just given everyone in the garden a small taste of his omnipotence. As the men are picking themselves up off the ground, Jesus again asks them, Who is it you want? Jesus of Nazareth, they said. Jesus answered, Hold you that I am he. If you are looking for me, then let these men go. This happened so that the words that he had spoken would be fulfilled. I have not lost one of those you gave me. Jesus loved his disciples. And like a good shepherd, he was protecting his sheep. This was his battle to fight, not theirs. Jesus just made it crystal clear to the armed men how powerful he is. He is setting the terms for his arrest, and he will not allow them to touch his disciples. Jesus is also fulfilling the words he prayed back in John 17, 12. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. Jesus is putting his words into action. He said he would protect the disciples. And despite what suffering will come to him, he will draw all attention to himself in order to protect his sheep. And then our dear Peter comes flying into action. He had boldly declared, I will lay down my life for you. So he impulsively draws his sword and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant, Malchus. Ladies, he probably wasn't aiming for the servant's ear. Most likely, he was aiming for his head, and he missed, thank goodness. 
Isn't it wonderful that Jesus included a variety of personality types within his disciples? Sometimes we can relate to doubting Thomas or practical Philip. Other times we boldly declare our faith only to falter under pressure like Peter. Jesus chose imperfect people, allowing us to see ourselves in those who walked with him and to learn from their mistakes. Jesus commands Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? First, Jesus commands Peter to put his sword away. In Matthew 26, 53, Jesus says to Peter, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? 12 legions of angels would be 72,000 angels. One angel in 2 Kings 19.35 killed more than 185,000 men in a single night. So this would be quite the angel army. But Jesus goes on to say, how then would the scriptures be fulfilled that say it must happen in this way? Jesus wasn't captured. He surrendered. He wasn't backed into a corner with nowhere left to turn. He obediently and faithfully followed God's plan in order to fulfill scripture and redeem humanity. It was all part of God's bigger plan that Peter didn't understand yet. This was not a battle that could be fought or won with human weapons. This was a spiritual battle and one only Jesus could fight and win. Jesus also says to Peter, shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? The cup Jesus will drink is the cup of God's wrath, a cup full of God's anger, fury, and judgment against sin, all sin. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 Jesus will drink the cup of God's wrath when he lays down his life and dies on the cross for all sinners. By giving his life, Jesus willingly substituted himself in our place. We deserve death. We deserve God's judgment. But Jesus lovingly took all of that on himself in order to save us. Because he obediently drank this cup, we get the privilege and the blessing of being able to drink the cup of fellowship, the cup of forgiveness, the cup of salvation. When we receive Jesus into our hearts, when we repent of our sins and confess our need for a Savior, Jesus becomes our substitute for God's wrath. Without Jesus, we still have to drink the cup of God's wrath. From which cup will you drink? The cup of God's wrath or the cup of salvation given through faith in Christ? Everyone has to choose a cup from which they will drink. God's wrath is waiting for those who will reject Jesus. But for those who believe in him, we receive a restored and eternal relationship with our Lord and Savior. This brings us to our first truth. Jesus obediently surrendered his life to restore our relationship with God. As Christians living after Jesus' death and resurrection, we don't know a life of not being able to talk directly to God. In the Old Testament, only the high priest could talk to God and only at set times. Jesus removed the cup of God's wrath by drinking it fully himself, allowing us a direct relationship with the Holy Trinity. The Holy Spirit now lives within believers. Jesus intercedes and prays for believers, and our Heavenly Father watches over and protects believers. Every day, we have the privilege of being in relationship with God. Every day we have the blessing of being able to pray to him. The question becomes, do we cherish these gifts? Do we praise Jesus frequently for being our substitute and restoring our relationship with God? Do we reflect on what our lives would be like without him? Sometimes the answer to these questions is a resounding yes, 
But sometimes we become so self-focused that we put God on hold, only talking to him when we're desperate. Sometimes, like Peter, we get overly confident in our own abilities and completely ignore God's direction and will. During Easter, we often look at the physical pain Jesus went through, but when's the last time you thought about the pain he endured by drinking the full cup of God's wrath? In Luke 22, 42 and 44, we find Jesus praying to God the Father in the Garden of Gethsemane before he was betrayed. Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. The cup he is referring to here is the cup of God's wrath. Ladies, he sweat drops of blood due to the anguish this cup was causing him. Yet, he obediently said yes to God's will and faithfully gave his life as a substitute for ours. Praise be to our Lord and Savior. Our next division is John 18, 12 through 27. Jesus' humility and suffering. Throughout this section, you will see Jesus juxtaposed against Peter. John goes back and forth between Jesus' trial and Peter's denial, showing us that they happened at the same time. We also see the glory of our Lord against the backdrop of Peter's denial. Jesus stand firm under the fire in order to save sinners like Peter who crumbled under trial. Let's read verses 12 through 14. Then the, the, then the detachment of soldiers with its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. These armed men, armed men witnessed Jesus' power when they fell over at his explosive words and when Jesus miraculously healed the ear of Malchus, as recorded in Luke twenty-two fifty-one. If they were paying attention, they would have seen Jesus' deity, but they chose to ignore the glory of Jesus and treat him instead like a criminal, arresting and binding him. They had already determined Jesus was guilty, and they wanted to shame him like a filthy, insignificant man. Jesus humbly allowed them to bind and arrest him. In the Old Testament, there's a story about Abraham and his son Isaac. God told Abraham to sacrifice his only son Isaac. So Abraham goes up to a mountain and prepares to sacrifice his son. Genesis 22, 9 says, When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Before Abraham sacrifices Isaac, God stops him and provides a ram for the sacrifice instead. Now go back with me to the Garden of Gethsemane, where God's one and only son, Jesus, the Lamb of God, is being bound Unlike Isaac, no substitute will be provided for Jesus because Jesus is our substitute. The, one, the only one capable of fully providing a way for us to be forgiven and reconciled to God. And tells us after binding Jesus, they take him to Annas. Annas was high priest from AD 6 through 15. He was then removed from office by the Romans. The position of high priest at this point has become more of a puppet for the Roman government rather than a position of honor from God. Because it was the Roman government who removed Annas from being high priest, many Jews did not consider it valid because according to Jewish law, the high priest was entitled to rule for life. Annas was a powerful and wealthy man and his family was known for its corruption. Eventually, five of his sons would become high priest as well. As we close out these verses, John again records the words of Caiaphas, first stated back in John 11. It is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole world, the whole nation perish. When Caiaphas uttered these words, he had no idea how true they would become. He was simply wanting to find a way to get rid of a troublemaker. 
Caiaphas liked his position of power. And he didn't want anything or anyone to take that from him. He wanted to get rid of Jesus. But as high priest that year, this year, Caiaphas unknowingly prophesied God's plan of redemption through the substitution of his son, Jesus. In John 18, 15 through 18, our focus shifts from Jesus to Peter. When Jesus was arrested, all the disciples fled, but Peter and another disciple find their way back to Jesus. We don't know for sure who the other disciple was, but it appears as though the disciple was John. Nowhere in John's gospel does he include his name, so it would be logical to assume once again he's chosen to refer to himself by some other title other than his name. For our lecture, we're going to assume the other disciple is John. Scripture goes on to tell us John was immediately allowed into the courtyard, but Peter had to wait. John must have had some connection to the high priest family and therefore was let in, but Peter was left outside alone, cold and scared. Maybe questions start rolling around in Peter's mind. Why didn't Jesus flee like every other time? Why didn't Jesus fight or at least let me fight? Why didn't Jesus do anything What's going to happen now? Jesus is Peter's rock. And Jesus has just been taken from him and Peter has no idea what's coming next. John comes back for Peter and the servant girl lets him into the courtyard. As Peter enters, she asks him, you aren't one of the man's disciples too, are you? Do you notice how the question is worded? Her question assumed a negative response. Peter had no reason to be afraid of the servant girl, but temptation caught him off guard. He wasn't prepared for her to ask him this question. He responds to her question with, I am not, and goes to warm himself by the fire with the servants and officials who are also warming themselves. He wants to blend in, hide himself, not be seen. But by trying to blend in, He's putting a space between him and Jesus that will prove to be a compromise that aids in his second and third denial. When trials and temptations come, the first place we need to run is to Jesus. Let's now go to verses 19 through 23, where John takes us back to Jesus. Jesus' trial was a capital trial punishable by death for the accused. Capital trials had even more rules than a regular trial to make sure they were fair. Jesus' trial broke so many of these rules. For example, no trial could take place at night, yet here it is, nighttime. The accused could not be questioned by a private individual, yet Jesus is being questioned by Annas alone. Third, no criminal could incriminate himself. Witnesses were required. When Annas directly questions Jesus about his disciples and his teachings, he's breaking the law. Legally, he should have been questioning Jesus' disciples or the people who had heard Jesus' teaching in the synagogues. When Jesus replies, he is pointing out the illegality of the trial, saying, find witnesses and do this right. It's pretty easy to assume at this point the Jewish leaders don't care about the law. They just want Jesus gone. After Jesus speaks, an official strikes him across the face, demanding, is this the way you answer the high priest? This is the first physical blow to Jesus, John records. Jesus remains calm and points out the slap was unjust because he did nothing wrong. Jesus had spoken truth, whether it sat well with them or not. Annas, not getting from Jesus what he wanted, sent him to Caiaphas. John doesn't record Jesus' trial before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. John goes directly from this trial to Jesus' trial before Pilate. When we put all the Gospels together, we find six phases in Jesus' trial. There were three religious trials and three civil trials. Jesus went before Annas, then before Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. And then to make it appear legal, Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin tried him again during daybreak. Then from there, Jesus goes on to Pilate, then to Herod, and then back to Pilate. Through each of his trials, Jesus stands firm and faithful. 
these people hate him without a cause, yet he humbly endures all the suffering because he loves us. Our section of scripture closes with Peter and his final two denials. Verses 25 through 27 read, Meanwhile, Simon Peter was still standing there warming himself. So they asked him, you aren't one of his disciples too, are you? He denied it, saying, I am not. One of the high priest's servants, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, challenged him, didn't I see you in the garden? Again, Peter denied it. And at that moment, a rooster began to crow. Peter is still warming himself with the group. When the second question comes, John says they asked him. The first question was asked by one servant girl. Now a group of people are questioning him. Peter's fears are rising, and again he denies he is one of Jesus' disciples, answering, I am not. The third and most challenging question comes from a relative of the high priest's servant whose ear Peter cut off. Peter, for the third time, denies his connection with Jesus, and at that moment, the rooster crows. Luke 22 records this story as well. In verses 60 through 62, Peter replies, Man, I don't know what you're talking about. Just as he was speaking, the rooster crowed. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter. Then Peter remembered the word the Lord had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows today, you will disown me three times. And he went outside and wept bitterly. No threats were coming directly at Peter. At this point, they were just asking questions, but Peter gave in to his fears. Peter, who had confidently declared he would lay down his life for Jesus, instead cowardly turned his back on him. Interestingly, Luke records Jesus saying to Peter prior to this event in Luke 22, 31 through 32, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift all of you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. Jesus warned Peter the battle was coming. Jesus guided Peter saying, Oh, sorry, I lost my spot. Jesus guided Peter, telling him to watch and pray so that he will not fall into temptation. Peter didn't heed the warning and fell asleep in the garden when he was supposed to be praying. Peter's self-confidence was lulling him into spiritual laziness. He needed to be alert and ready for the battle. Instead, he was dismissing Jesus' warning and forgetting to pray. In John 21, we will see Jesus restoring Peter. This experience will strengthen Peter's faith and humble him. It will help him understand his own weakness and the importance of constantly abiding in Christ. God will use this failure to better equip Peter. Peter will go on to become a great gospel preacher. When encouraging Christians, he will now have a personal experience from which to draw. He will be able to better explain the importance of standing strong under trial. Satan meant to destroy Peter, but once again, God had a plan and God's plan always wins. Unlike Peter, Jesus physically and emotionally suffered at the hands of those he came to save. A so-called friend betrayed him. One from his inner circle denied him. He was illegally tried and beaten, eventually dying the most painful death by crucifixion. Yet not once did he falter. Not once did he go against God's plan. He endured the suffering, ridicule, embarrassment, and pain because of his sacrificial love for us. Romans 5.8 says, But God demonstrates his love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Jesus died for us. This brings us to our final truth. Jesus willingly suffered because of his love for us. Christ suffered and died because of his unconditional love for us. A love we don't deserve, yet a love he graciously gives to us. Judas rejected Jesus' love. He put on a good act, appeared to be a follower of Christ, but he never fully surrendered his heart to Christ. 
Peter fully and passionately loved Christ, gave him his whole heart, but fell into temptation when his faith was challenged. Peter repented of his sin and ran back into Jesus' arms where he was restored. Let's look at Judas and Peter as we reflect on our own lives. If you are a follower of Christ, his love should be transforming your life. The point at which you received Jesus into your heart should be a pivotal point in your timeline. Even for those of us who grew up in a Christian home, there should be a point where our faith became our own. If your life looks like it did before you became a believer, spend some time wrestling with whether you've truly surrendered your heart to Christ. Who's the authority in your life? Whose will do you follow? Maybe, like Peter, you have fully surrendered your heart to Christ, but have fallen into temptation. Sometimes pride and self-confidence can cause us to slowly start slipping away from God. We spend less time with him and more time with the world trying to blend in. And before we know it, sin has a foothold in our lives. If that's the case for you today, come back to Jesus. Like Peter, let Christ restore your relationship with him. Let him use this setback to grow your faith and your ministry for him. God's love is powerful, and his plans for you will never fail. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus. Thank you that he is our substitute. Thank you that because of him, we can enjoy eternal life with you. Lord, please be with us as we go from here to our discussion groups. Let your presence be felt within these groups. Help us to be able to dive deeper into your word. Illuminate the truths that you want us to see. In Christ's name we pray, amen.